Hello, and welcome to the Vedic Conversation, where each episode we take a different topic and look at it through the lens of storytelling and from the perspective of the Veda, an ancient but still very much relevant body of knowledge from India. I'm Derek Yanford, a Vedic meditation teacher based in New York City, and I'm joined by my Vedic colleagues Anthony Thompson in London and Rory Kinsella in Sydney. Today's guest is a very dear friend of mine that I've known for many years who recently became a student. Michelle Critella Bailey is the co-founder and operator of Backstage Dance Center that is going into their 23rd year of business, offering dance lessons to students of all ages in a variety of styles. Outside of being a teacher and artist, Michelle also is the COO of Project Courage, a treatment center to help those recovering from drug addiction. Married to her beautiful wife, Ellen, with their lovely daughter, Lucy, their family can be found participating within their community, whether it be through the practice of yoga, marathon running, or some other challenge they all want to engage in together. I invite you to listen to Michelle's incredible stories and her journey with meditation, but don't forget to stick around until the end, where we'll share how you can become involved in the conversation. And remember, please subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. Please welcome to the show, Michelle Cretella Bailey. <laughs> Thanks, welcome. Derek. I was anticipating you saying Cretella because that's how you refer to me. Well, it, it is funny because I wasn't sure too. I was like, in in my phone, everywhere that I have you, mm-hmm. I always refer to you as Cretella. So I never <laughs> use your full name. So that would be the first and last time. Okay. <laughs> So people know. I'm I'm really excited that you're here, um, especially just because I feel like you have so much in terms of what you can offer our audience in that you've learned meditation fairly recently. And I know that you've been really kind of involved and you've got into rounding and you have a lot that you can speak about in terms of your life pre-meditation, post-meditation. So I guess my first question really is... What led you and me to actually get together and and you to decide, okay, yeah, I want to figure out what meditation has to offer me? Yeah, I am a yoga instructor. And during that training was exposed to meditation. And so I dabbled in it in a variety of different ways, but nothing that ever clicked for me or something that I wanted to engage in on a regular basis. Some of them too strict in terms of how you have to sit, hold poses. I think you and I had a conversation about that once. Um, And so nothing ever really stuck, but I knew that it was something that based on my lifestyle and pace of my life, I should do just to relax and calm down a little bit. Um, And then I saw a shift in you. I mean, as you said, we've known each other for a long time and see each other at least once a year. And I knew that you had gone away to India. And then upon your return, I probably noticed the biggest shift and just wanted what you had. Um, And it's not something that's tangible or something that I could say it was this that you said. It was just your being. Um, There was a, a piece that I wanted or that I craved, I guess is a better word. And then I had asked you, we had set something up in April and then the pandemic hit. And so we canceled that. But in that time, I started listening to this podcast and you had a guest on um, that spoke about drinking um, and how it made her meditation feel dirty and uh, that it altered her state of consciousness and just her wanting to be present. So I got rid of drinking. I was never really a big drinker. Um, I come from a household of addiction. So I would always try and control it, limit it to two drinks or less and definitely not every day and not alone. But I was like, what if I just get rid of this completely? So I got rid of that. Then um, because of a different podcast, I dropped down to being vegetarian and now I'm vegan. And so I slowly started to make these shifts without even practicing meditation. And then in November, you were generous and offered to come, even though it would only be two people. 
and you taught me. And at first for the 90 days, I did it because you said to do it. <laughs> um, you said two times a day. The morning was never a problem. The, I would get up. I would do it. It was not a problem. It was giving myself the opportunity to have the time it, elsewhere in the day. And it was always, I'm too busy. I'm running from one job to the next. I'm a mom. I don't have time for that. But really, it gives me more time um, because I'm not falling asleep. Um, I get the surge of energy and I'm able to keep going. So now my afternoon one, I mean, they're both you know favorable, but I enjoy my afternoon one so much more um, at this stage of practice. So. Mm, that, that's great. Everything that you just said is so amazing. But I, I do want to talk about this one other thing, sure. this aspect, because I know that you and I talk quite a bit about your practice when you have questions. And I love that we have this dialogue. And one of the things that struck me <laughs> in the beginning, you were like, is it normal for me to be crying? <laughs> well, in my household growing up, you didn't cry. It was always, you're fine. You're fine. Keep going. Figure out a way to keep going. And so I'm very durable and that's how I'm able to do so much in a day. I can compartmentalize and put things in a box and move along. And um, crying was taught to me to be somewhat of a sign of weakness. And through a lot of therapy, I, I know that it's not. And I know you always say better out than in, but there's still a part of that that's uncomfortable for me. Um, especially in a room full of people, I'm better doing it by myself. But now with the meditation, I even find myself getting emotional in groups of people. Something will spontaneously come up and I'm trying to control it. It gets stuck like right in my throat and I can, I can feel it. Um, but I try and remind myself that it's okay and to let it, let it flow. Yeah. And last question and then I'll, I'll let yes. my colleagues jump in too yes. is, so I think you kind, your experience is unique a little bit in that I did teach you and your colleague Ryan mm -hmm. together, yeah. um, which ended up leading to me coming back and teaching a host of people for Ryan. Um, but you and Ryan also were able to participate in a rounding immersion that I did with two of my colleagues from the spring. And if you don't mind, can you talk a little bit about your experience, about what you thought it was going to be, what it was, and how it's kind of parlayed into what you do now? Yes. Yeah, so at the time when I originally signed up, I don't think I knew what I was in store for, other than it was an extension of what I was already doing. And as my teacher, I trusted you. So I wanted to experience it. I'm not a, a reader. I'm just kind of a jump in and go. And so Ryan started reading the rules or not rules. That's not right. Not rules, but suggestions, uh, eliminating coffee, um, not working out. And he's like, do you know that we can't work out during this? And I was like, well, we can walk. I think I even asked you, can I walk? <laughs> you just questioned my intention behind the walk. Um, and so I was like, well, I'm signed up. And I, I did it. And the thought of not doing anything for four days seemed terrifying at the time for, for someone that does so much. I, I tried to like, could I check email once a day? I didn't ask you that, but in my mind, just sort of figuring out how was I going to do this? And then I just, when I do something, I'm either all in or I'm not. So I just want to give myself the complete experience. And it was profound. I couldn't wait to do it again. I did it again um, with you in May, I think in May. So the first time was January, Martin Luther King weekend, and then mm -hmm. that one. And that knowing what to expect, I was counting the days until it came. It's the permission that I give myself during that time to completely shut off. Um, and even with that, it launched me into something else because both times I had this incredible desire to purge mm. after the rounding. And I started to listen to the minimalists and watch their documentary. And then I did their challenge, getting rid of, you know, over 30 days, 465 items. And I don't know, every time the people within the community have really been wonderful 
and listening to them inspires me to want to try and do other things. Um, and so I'm really grateful for that. So I, I can't wait to do it again. I think you said the next one's in November. Yeah, either yeah. Labor Day or uh, Veterans Day. It's one of those okay. two, I think. Yeah. yeah. So awesome. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd like to hear a bit about, you mentioned the alcohol, and I think you were talking about Claire Robbie, who was, who was on the podcast. And often when we talk about alcohol, it's people who've been really serious drinkers. Um, so it'd be good to hear your experience of being going from being a moderate drinker to, to not drinking, because often people think, well, I only have a glass of wine, that's kind of nothing. And they don't, they don't kind of see that the effect that it has, like even a small amount has. So it'd be great to hear your experience of going from being not drinking very much to nothing. Yes. Um, in the podcast that I listened to in your first season, the woman spoke about um, the simplicity of sitting on the couch because it relaxes you and having a drink. Is it the drink that relaxes you or is it the sitting on the couch? And I started to examine that there, there were definite habits of when I would engage, even though it was one or two, it was that end of the night, I'm on the couch with my wife, I'm going to have some whiskey and unwind and watch a show. And um, it was, it was fine for me to do it. I never really, uh, because my father, I grew up in a household with addiction, I didn't ever want to be addicted to anything. So that was always on my radar. But the reaction of people was probably the hardest and the pressure of you can have just one. Why can't you have one? And it was just a choice that I was making. And I would tell people that this is just what I'm doing today. There's I don't know if I'll do it tomorrow, but for today I'm doing it um, now. They don't even ask, but I would definitely say maybe for four months, a lot of pressure to engage with them in that. Um, and the other interesting thing is my tolerance for being in the company of people um, and the way that it alters them has shifted a little bit. Um, so I, I stay and until I'm not enjoying it anymore. And then I, I leave. Um, but it, it's, it was interesting. I, I didn't expect, I'm close to 50, so I didn't expect that much pressure because I'm not younger, but there was a lot of pressure just because everyone else was, was doing it. So, yeah. I can, I can relate to that because um, I too gave up drink quite some time ago. I wasn't a heavy drinker, mm -hmm. but when I gave it up, a lot of my friends and associates and colleagues, you know, they found it very threatening. Yeah. You know, they thought that perhaps I was going to be judging them. Um, and I, the fact that I was abstaining from drink made them feel awkward and yeah. uncomfortable. Uh, did, did anybody ever express that to you? Did you sort of pick up on that? Or, or was, it, was it a little bit more subtle than that? It was more subtle. The one thing that they would say, and all of this has happened in an eight month period of time. So I, they were noticing shifts of, I'm now a vegetarian. Why are you a vegetarian? I, you know, you haven't been a vegetarian and just, it doesn't bother me. I find something to eat wherever I go, but it seems more bothersome to them. And then they saw, now you're giving up the drinking and, and why, what, what is all of this? So they were more uncomfortable with me. I even said to Derek at one point, Prior to meditation, um, I'm a big reactor, or I can be, and now my reaction is less, and people don't know what to do with that. They almost mm -hmm. look to me in the room for the reaction and are uncomfortable that I don't have it, or they they want me to respond in that way, and when I don't, they don't really know what to do with me. So that's been interesting too. So I think it was just a lot of shifts happening in a very small amount of time and in a profound way. Can I ask, had you been looking for meditation? Have you tried any other meditation techniques? Mm -hmm. I mean, apart from yoga, which obviously had a little bit of element perhaps of, of meditation, what else have you been looking at? Um, I had done, I, 
I may be pronouncing this incorrectly, um, this pasana meditation, um, but you had to sit with strong determination and not move. And what I was doing during that time was counting the minutes. I had done a weekend retreat in silence and it was, I only have five more hours. I only have four more hours. So that dialogue was happening in my, in my head. So I wasn't med meditating at all. I was just being quiet, uncomfortable and enduring for as long as I can instead of enjoying what I was mm. doing. Um, and, and then probably what I was able to do for the longest period of time was I had purchased a book that just had a short passage and I would read the passage and then just sit quietly, not necessarily with my eyes closed, um, but just reflect on whatever the passage was. Um, I'm a group fitness instructor. And so I would use that as sort of motivation for my classes um, and just a little bit of inspiration too. But other than that, nothing formal. I'm curious too, because I know that, you know, like this morning we, we shared a little story today because mm -hmm. it seems like <laughs> when you tend my group meditation, whatever prompt or topic that I'm talking about, it seems to show up and then we'll, we'll have a little back mm -hmm. and forth about it. But can you tell me a little bit more? I know like the story of you trying to help Lucy tie her shoes and what your normal mm -hmm. reaction would be and like when the remote got lost and things of that nature and how you either are able to take stock or someone else points out to you how your reaction or what you think your reaction is very different now that you've been meditating. <laughs> Lucy, Lucy is seven and she is not only my greatest gift, but she really is a barometer for how far I've come. I see a lot of how far I've come in her reactions because she was beginning to react the way that I react. Um, having that little bit of an outburst or mini, not tantrum, but just a little explosion that over something that's small. Um, and I think that I was just living in such a state of stress that it didn't take very much to ignite that. So the meditation has helped my threshold so it takes a lot more now, but um, tying her shoes was such a gift. Normally that would have been a very stressful process. She, I don't know where she gets it from, but she's type A, she's a perfectionist. She likes things to click right away. And it was frustrating for her. And she sat in front of me and I was helping her and we were both so calm. That was a real eye opener for me that um, she finally figured it out and that we had done it without not one outburst or bit of stress or tension. We giggled during it um, and it was fun. So if that is the benefit of meditation, then I wouldn't trade it for anything because I don't know, when you have a child, you just want to give them everything. So if I can give her that peace rather than the frustration and the stress, that's the biggest win of them all. Mm. So, yeah. Beautiful. I wonder whether having Lucy in your life has changed any of your approaches or opinions. Mm. I, you know, I did not want um, to have children until I was 36. And I think at 36, I started to crave a family and I'm grateful that I had her when I was older. I had her at 40 um, because I appreciate her so much. Um, and I'm not as selfish as I was when I was younger. Um, having her, um, I carried um, Ellen's egg. So there was a process involved with that. And um, it was all beautiful. And the irony is I probably would have had a hundred children because I loved being pregnant. I never thought I would. Um, being a dancer and body and everything being thrown off. I, I didn't think I would like that. I loved every moment of it. I loved having her. 
everything. There hasn't been a stage that I haven't loved. So I'm grateful for age um, and experiencing it when I am taking the time to enjoy it instead of rushing through the process. But correct me if I'm wrong with too, like the process of mm-hmm. having her, like mm-hmm. it was life-threatening at one point too. Oh, um, yeah. So I had placenta accretia and that meant that I was in jeopardy. So they made the decision to, um, to take her at 35 weeks, which meant that her lungs had not yet released surfactin. So she, she blew a hole in her lungs. And then there was a lot of other things that came from that. So, um, for me, I had to make a decision, um, at, prior to pregnancy, that if my placenta was attached to my uterus, would I let them do an emergency hysterectomy? And um, the answer was yes, because I wanted to be with Lucy as soon as possible. Um, and the other, the other piece is that means you're under for a long time. And I'm not a scientist, but once they take you down, they can't bring your heart rate low is what I was told. And so they had a short amount of time to do both surgeries unless they knocked me out completely. And I wanted to be awake during the whole thing. So um, because the recovery time was shorter and I got to Lucy quicker and I had intended to nurse her. And so we did that. And thankfully I was in great health because they got through both surgeries. I didn't need any extra blood um, or or products, which was great. So um, I'm very lucky. I had the best team of people and we knew about it in advance. So um, when I received the message at the time, it didn't seem like a blessing, but it really was because I was able to choose my team, make decisions in advance of instead of on the spot and um, everything worked out. She's perfect. She was in the NIC unit for 35 days, but even being there, the nurses taught me so much as a first time mom from how to burp the right, you know, burp her the right way to getting her on a feeding schedule, just things that I would have had to figure out on my own by trial and error. So even being in the NIC unit was such a blessing. We go back every Christmas because Lucy was there on Christmas and we bring the nurses Um, gifts, because one of the things that I observed is they do so much for the families, but the nurses are there missing their time with their families on the holiday. And nobody really, they're just taking care of everybody else. So, and I don't ever want Lucy to forget where we came from. Mm. So, yeah. Beautiful. I mean, I think the other thing with adversity too, is I'm interested in, because you kind of learned how to meditate like in the midst of the pandemic Mm -hmm. and having the type of business that you had, which was live in-person classes and switching to Zoom and staying afloat when a lot of other studios had to come to the realization that they couldn't continue operating that that way and close down. What do you think is one of the greatest gifts being in the pandemic and or learning to meditate while that was happening has brought to you? Clarity. (laughs) is the word that comes to mind because normally my brain operates at a thousand miles a minute. And so I'm always thinking about next steps. And in the pandemic, you couldn't do that because you could change something and then receive new information and have to change again. So it was really about being in the moment and normally, um, I, as I mentioned earlier, am under a tremendous amount of pressure and stress and, and was volatile quickly. And so that I think would have sent me over the edge. So um, the piece that I was able to find, and I found myself saying to my teachers, we're just going to wait and see what happens. And normally that is not something that I would do. And what I found during it, hindsight, is we always had exactly what we needed. So as a business owner for over 20 years, you don't expect to be in that situation where your business is on the line and you could lose it at a moment's notice. And 
every month I have a business partner. I was like, can we do it? it I, I didn't think we could do it. We would sit and do numbers and it didn't look possible. And then something would happen. Someone would come up with an idea. We would implement it and we would have an influx of money that was exactly what we needed, not what we wanted, what we needed to get through that month. And we literally did it one month at a time and it mm. all worked out. But um, yeah, so the biggest lesson was in, I didn't get what I wanted, but I definitely got what I needed oh, on a month to month basis. Yeah. Day to day. So are you like at full swing now? Like are you fully operational or do you still have some restrictions or? We are fully operational. What's interesting is dancing school runs on a cycle. And so in September, even schools weren't back um, in full swing and people were choosing distance learning as options. So a lot of our dance family said, well, we're going to take this year off and we'll see you next year. And inside it was like, if there is a dance studio next year, I, I would never say that, but that's what I would think. And then um, summer came and that's when they started to lift masks. And so people want to be outside and dancing school is inside. So our summer is better than it was last year. And, and that's what I'm focusing on in September, we'll see, but <laughs> I'm going to stick with, uh, I'll be given exactly what I need. So I don't spend a lot of time worrying about it. There was definitely a two years ago at this time, I would have spent a lot of time perseverating on it. I don't mm. do that. Mm. Um, it's July and we're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll go with that. That's good. You just seem to be, I remember remarking, you know, you look different and you seem to be in a different space all together. Do you know what I mean? Like I, it's subtle in some ways and significant in other ways because there is this, I, I remember, <laughs> because I've taught at your studio mm -hmm. many times. Yeah. And I remember in the early days and the dancer mentality and that mindset that we have about perfection is you would maybe run a rehearsal turn the music on, and then the first mistake, you'd be like, oh, nope, got to go back. We're going back to the beginning. And it would be like, oh, wow, they didn't even get like 30 seconds in. And she's <laughs> And now you're so much more, okay, that that thing happened. How can we learn from that? How can we move on? And I feel like you've, you've taken that into not only your business life, but your personal life. But I, I want to talk about, and I think you do so many things, like, the yoga part and the marathon. I, I want to talk a little bit about the 48 miles over 48 hours and how mm -hmm. you came, what that was about, <laughs> how you came to that decision, because this still kind of blows my mind. And for everybody for everybody who doesn't know what I'm talking about, kind of back us up and like sure. walk us through it. <laughs> it's the David Goggins challenge. So Rory's a runner, right? Rory? Yeah. yeah. So I love having a, a, a podcast fan on here. You just <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm intimate with all three of you. Um, so David Goggins um, created a challenge. Okay. It's four miles every four hours for 48 hours. So you're doing 48 miles. And I surround myself with people that are like me, a little crazy, I'll, I'll do anything once and I never count myself out. So I have unwavering belief in myself. So I am a marathon runner like Rory, but the difference is I did a marathon and I thought, well, I've done this. I don't need to do it again. So then I did an ultra, which was 33. And then during the pandemic, my best friend Heather and I were bored and we thought, let's run 40 miles. It'll be like an adult play date and we'll just talk the whole time. And so in the middle of the pandemic, we went out on a Saturday and it took us eight hours and we ran 40 miles and it was just fun. That's what we did for fun that day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you have to know, I mean, we're, we're very like-minded, but so we did that. And then Ryan, who I learned to meditate with said, there's this challenge. And he knew if he asked me, I would say, of course. So Heather, Ryan, and I agreed to do this on a particular day. 
Um, but we just love community and love having an impact on the community. So we tapped into uh, May is um, Mental Health Awareness Month, and that's the month that we ran it in. And so we went to our local youth and family services and asked if there was a need. And each one identified a need, a program that they lost grant funding for during the pandemic. And so our mission was to replace that. So we chose three youth and family services with three different programs, and then we replaced that funding. So mm. in total, it was about $8,000 distributed between the three. Um, and I work at Project Courage, as Derek said during the intro, and some of our clients ran it with us. So we did the full David Goggins challenge, but what we offered to our clients is if you, you want to do one mile, every four hours for 48 hours. You can do that if you want to do two miles. So it was just about moving and being together. Um, one of the towns was generous enough to leave all of the lights on at their track so we would be safe in the middle of the night and have a place that we could go and, and do it together. Even though we weren't running at the same pace, we were all on the same track. So that was really great. And we got to see each other and support each other. Um, so it was a lot of fun. And then wow. I'm running um, New York City Marathon for the first time in November. And that um, is for Race for Chase um, related to the Sandy Hook shootings. So they asked me to be a charity runner. So I swear I would never do another marathon, but I've heard New York City is pretty incredible. Rory, have you done <laughs> New York City? No, no, I haven't. Um, my sister lives in Boston, so I have a I have a dream of one day doing Boston, which is mm -hmm. like you know mm -hmm. the, the elite amateur marathon. Um, but yeah, amazing. So so with the four four miles every four hours. So would you do the four miles and then chill out for however long? So uh, what I was most worried about was sleep deprivation because I do enjoy my sleep. It doesn't have to be a lot, but I enjoy it. So my wife and I, my wife did it as well. We did it in shifts so that one of us was always home with Lucy. So my best friend, Heather, and I did our four. And then when we returned, Ellen would go out with our friend, Stephanie, and they would do their four. So um, in between, um, surprisingly, I had given myself permission to miss meditation and I, and the first day I, I did it because I felt okay to, and it actually gave me a surge of energy. And I told um, Heather that I would not miss a meditation because the energy that I had from it, she was actually like, did you take something? What are you doing? I was talking a lot as we were going. And um, I said, no, I just meditated, but I feel fantastic. So, I kept up with daily household chores um, and meditated. That's kind of what was in between and rest. And have you experienced your, yeah, the experience of being a runner before and after meditating? Have you noticed any change there? Just, just kind of for me, like before I, I ran a marathon before I learned to meditate and it was very much grit your teeth and I'm going to, I'm going to do this, you know, overcome my, um, pain and stuff like that whereas after I became a lot more um easy going about it and being a relaxed runner seemed to me that I kind of got injured less and I suffered less mm -hmm. did you have any experience like that I would say what I noticed is the silence part is, is more okay um so the ability to I don't need something to run with I can I don't need a podcast or a playlist. Um, the ability to just run and, and be okay with that um, would probably be the biggest shift. I, I never was one to suffer, um, even pre-meditation. I'm always worried about becoming injured and then not being able to do it long-term and working out is really important for me. So even when I was training for my first marathon, I did the minimum... I mean, I followed a training schedule and felt very prepared, but I only did the minimum amount of running just to protect myself. Um, 
but I would say the ability to run in silence and be okay with it was probably um, the biggest shift. I think you make a really, really interesting point about exertion and recovery. You know, that this is one of the one of the things that perhaps new meditators don't immediately appreciate that we are receiving this very profound dynamic rest, mm. which allows us then to take dynamic action. Mm. And I think the story you told is is just you know epitomizes that beautifully. Um, have you noticed that you um, are able to actually increase your output on the track or running? I mean, are you are you doing more training than you used to before, or are you maintaining the same level? I'm maintaining the same level, but in my work life, um, and I, I always have Derek's voice in the back of my head, not to take on too much extra <laughs> because I feel like I can. Mm -hmm. um, it's very easy for me to get caught up in that. Um, a new gym just opened and asked me to come on and teach one class. And I said, sure. And then they asked me for two more. And I said, yes. <laughs> and um, Ellen was very quick to say, here we go. And I said, oh, no, that, that's it, because then I'm going to start to. So the ability to stop, because normally there's a little bit of ego there. And it's also something that I love and I'm passionate about. Um, but normally I would I would just keep piling it on. If there's room, I'll fit it in. So mm -hmm. um, my my work has been more productive and efficient. Um, there are times where I actually worry that I'm under motivated. I used to wake up at four and hit the ground running. And now I have such a lovely morning routine of meditation and sitting with my coffee. And so I don't do as much in the morning as I used to, but that's my favorite time of day to be with myself. Uh, okay, I want to unpack that a little bit more, <laughs> only because I feel like what you're touching upon is one of the things I definitely know prospective students and other friends of mine who I've talked to have this fear a little bit that they're, some part of their personality or the way that they operate is going to change, that they, they believe stress is a good thing, and it's stressful situations that make them perform the way that they do, and they don't want to lose that edge or whatnot, and it's kind of hard to explain sometimes from my perspective how potentially, yes, that could happen. However, what you might notice is a better version of yourself will begin to step forward. So you're not the stressed out crazy person at work that you used to be. You're not engaging in many of the things that kind of reared you up, but you're enjoying yourself a little bit more. And so it sounds like, and I know, I, I remember too, you were... I think there was times you were teaching at the gym at like five o'clock in the morning or, yes. or things of that nature. Mm -hmm. So with a person who does as much as you are doing, and now that you have a little bit more time and space and maybe don't feel as productive or motivated, can you, would you go back or can you talk about, compare and contrast how those things are a little bit different than you anticipated, but why you prefer what you have now over what you had before? Yes, I think I was spending a lot of time doing things that weren't necessary. At the time, I felt like they were very necessary. Um, over, over documenting, over preparing, over, you know, someone said to me once, um, you are the most out of control when you feel the most in control. And I was definitely doing all that I could to feel as in control as possible. So there were a lot of emails being sent in the morning. I, I don't like to think that I was micromanaging, but I probably was. Um, and I had very competent um, team members in both aspects of work, Project Courage and um, Backstage Dance Center they don't need me reminding them of things. So I think I was not using my time wisely. Um, and so now I really choose when I'm gonna engage in work 
in the most meaningful way instead of just, I think I was being busy because feeling busy felt very normal to me. My mom worked three jobs and the only time you saw her resting was when she was sleeping. She would sit on the couch and she would, oh, that's the other thing. I used to nap. I used to be great at a 20 minute cat nap. I don't, I've tried to nap. I can't nap <laughs> anymore. <laughs> Napping has gone away. I, it's funny because I used to just sleep for 20 minutes, which is how long I, I meditate for. But it was as if I always needed that and just didn't know it. So my body was taking care of it on its own by, mm-hmm. by me napping. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I wouldn't change a thing. I love my morning time. And it's amazing how much time I have now that I'm not doing all of those little unnecessary tasks. Mm, beautiful. Yeah. I, I'll talk a little bit about your wife and mm-hmm. your relationship, just because I feel like, you know, again, because I've known you for such a long time, mm-hmm. You were married once before, Mm -hmm. but to a man. Mm -hmm. And I think for the most part, you know, I'm a little hesitant to say or just the way that I might say it is that I thought that you were straight, you know, for how long. And then Ellen came into your life and then you got married and you had a child. It was like, wait, who is this, Michelle? Like, what what's going on? So can you maybe just talk a little bit more about your family dynamic and how that looks very different than it did years ago. Yes. And Derek, you played a huge part in that. I don't know if you remember those conversations, but you really did. Um, So I was married and it was fine. We are still very good friends. We got along beautifully. We never fought at all. We were both very passionate about our careers and supported each other in our careers. And he was, a, is a lovely man. I have nothing bad to say about him. Um, but I knew I wanted more than to just be roommates because that's what it was. We commiserated about work. He was 10 years older than me. Um, and I think that played a part too. Um, But I just knew I wanted more. And that was really hard for people to understand that I was getting a divorce, but nothing was wrong. He didn't Mm. cheat on me. He didn't abuse me. He was kind. I, I had a lot of pushback over the divorce, how lucky I was to have found someone like that. He made a lot of money. He took very good care of our family. Um, Mm. But I just knew that it wasn't enough. And I thought every person deserves, you know, just their best. And and I wanted more. So we were divorced. I was dating. I had actually written a list of the 10 things that I wanted in a partner. And I put them on my refrigerator. And they were very simple. Have a job and be a productive member of society. Like to work out, like dogs. It was not anything crazy. I never put if I wanted a male or a female, which is funny. Um, And so I had dated one woman for about two months. Um, That didn't go anywhere. And then Ellen started taking my classes at the gym. And I could tell that she was flirting with me. And I I think I even called her on it. And I said, you're flirting with me. (laughs) Um, Because I can be direct. And I think you were coming to teach for me. And I said, I don't, I don't know. Like, am I in love with a woman? Am I gay? I don't know. And you said, Michelle, (laughs) some nights you like chicken, some nights you like fish. (laughs) You're loving a person, brown hair, blonde hair, blue eyes, green eyes, male, female, just be open to being in love with a person. And you, we've had a lot of those conversations. You're an incredible human who has guided me without even knowing it probably, but she checked every box on that list and nowhere on it did it say it had to be a male. So 
um, I went with it. And, th- and there were some things along the way. I was nervous about holding her hand in the grocery store. What would parents think at my dancing school? And then she was always very patient with me. She's a very patient woman. And she said, what if you have a student that wants to be in a same-sex relationship? Are, are you saying it's not okay? Mm. And so I thought about that. And then I, I held her hand and I've been holding her hand since. And um, it's funny because people think of us as that we're that lesbian couple, you know, <laughs> um, it's funny. And they want to hear my coming out story, but I don't really have one. I just <laughs> fell in love with Ellen. Everyone falls in love with Ellen. You've met her. She's pretty yeah. incredible. Hard not um, to, but um, I'm grateful that I was open to it because she truly, uh, our relationship is incredible. It's been eight years and it, it just keeps getting better. So if I wasn't open to that, if I had closed myself off to that, I wouldn't have experienced it. So thank you for telling me to fall in love with a human and not, you know, a gender. Uh, You're welcome. (laughs) Uh, I do remember a conversation that we had, you know, especially about partnership and Mm -hmm. who that person is. And Mm A lot of times it's the person who's going to deal with all that baggage, all the stuff, all the crap that you, the, you know, and as dancers and as dance teachers, we can lead a very crazy life and have a very crazy schedule. And someone who's going to put up with that is, is, is often a keeper. It's just interesting. Like you met her, fell in love, had Lucy, everything kind of happened very, very quickly. Mm-hmm. And now I guess the question too is, you know, your daughter has two mothers. Mm. And what, what is that dynamic like for you? Um, I, I worry a lot for her um, because I, I, I don't ever want her, I, I can't save her from that. She's going to go through whatever she's going to go through. I know that. But that protective mommy doesn't want someone to criticize her because she has two moms. And so, and people, um, they're microaggressions, right? So we went to sign her up for kindergarten and the form said mother, father. Mm. And I drew a line through and I wrote Ellen's name and I handed it. We had to give the forms to three different people, the school nurse, the administrator, And I handed it to the first person and she said, oh, what does your husband do? And I said, my wife is the bail commissioner. (laughs) And then I went to the nurse and even though I had written it on the form. And so I was thinking, this is actually a really good story. I was, I kept thinking, oh, what am I doing? I'm sending her to a school where they automatically assume that it's mother, father. Like this is, this is going to be a burden for her. And the universe is very funny what it puts in your path. I was asked to speak at the high school as an entrepreneur. And I met the most incredible senior. He too was presenting because he had started a business. And I just found him so interesting. And I went over and I started talking to him. And I said, what do your parents do? And he said, oh, I have two moms. And I said, you have two moms? And I said, how did you find your experience going through the school and and, and how were you treated? And he said, well, my mom's raised me not to care. And so that's when it occurred to me that it didn't matter what other people said or how they treated her. What mattered was how she handled it. Mm. And so that's where I come in. That's what I can do. I can't stop somebody from saying something to her, but I can help her understand that she's beautiful and she was created out of love and mm. that's all that matters. That that that's what a family is. It's two people sharing love and then bring your child in. So um that was such an awesome thing to have happen and the timing was so perfect. He just appeared and when he said two moms, I was like, you've got to be kidding me. So <laughs> um yeah. Beautiful. So interesting, you know, like this is this is one of the reasons why I really wanted to have you on the show because of all the conversations we've had and 
well, I don't want to say challenges, but just I get to watch you handle things that I think of that are I could never do. Like all the time that you put into Project Courage with the studio, being a mom, doing all the stuff in the community, and it's like, you know, we're roughly the same age. I feel like I haven't done a fraction of those things, you know, and I want to teach meditation and, and kind of help everybody's potential kind of jump forward. And I think you are a shining example of that. And I'm so excited to continue to see how meditation plays out in all of these other scenarios and whatnot. And I think it's I, it's truly a delight to have you on the show so that our audience can hear from someone firsthand, it's been less than a year that you've been mm -hmm. meditating and you have all these wonderful, amazing things to share with our audience. So I'm so grateful for you, Michelle, to come on the show. Thank you for having me on. Okay, thanks for sticking around until the end. We're always looking for new ways to engage with you, our audience. I would love to know what topics and themes would be of interest to you. Also, who would you like to see as our guests? Perhaps you might be interested in coming on the show and talking with us. We would love to have you. Please share your thoughts and ideas with us with a direct message on our Instagram. And for those of you who are not camera shy, please feel free to share a video with the hashtag The Vedic Conversation. Also, please take a moment to subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. And if you found value and benefit in this episode, please share it with your audience and consider giving us a positive review to help others find us. <laughs>